Hey, welcome to another episode of Amazing Plastic, the Scale Model Show. With me today, I am privileged to have a very unique individual. This is the individual who not only spans decades of artwork with uh, posters that you may not even realize he did. Uh, he also did some great, amazing work on Terminator 2. He's an author, he's an artist, he's a musician. And he's a heck of a nice guy. With me today is the man who painted the big white lady for the Star Trek, the motion picture. With me is Mr. Paul Olson. How are you today, sir? I'm very well, Richard, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. A bit over the top, but that's okay. <laughs> well, that's what I do. That's my job. So, so Paul, tell me uh, a little bit about how you got into this business of working in Hollywood. Uh, well, I was um, I was living here. I was living in the UK, where I'm living now, and uh, and I wanted to move to. I was on my way to Australia, in fact, and I went to a party. It was the going away party for Supertramp. The going to moving to America party in 1975, and uh, so I went to that party and I met an English girl there who had crashed the party, and she was an artist. And uh, she wanted to go to San Francisco and open up a studio. And so we decided to throw our lot in together, and we drove across America. And because I had only been away from San Francisco for five years, and I was San Francisco's most noted artist, if you will. I was in the papers all the time and on TV and on radio. Uh, so I thought I could use you know refresh all my contacts and you know we could have a leg up and and you know get an art studio going fairly quickly and then uh, we fought and made up all the way across america driving across <laughs> america and uh uh and in the middle of the night we were staying at a friend of mine's house and she jumped in the car with all my stuff in it and drove down to la <laughs> and i got up in the morning and the car was gone. <laughs> and my friend said, uh, she fucked off, you know. And uh, so I made it down to L.A. And she was staying with a friend of a friend of mine uh, who was Peter Lloyd. And Peter Lloyd was a top, top, top airbrush artist, just wonderful stuff. And uh, so I met Peter, and he was English, and he and I got along. And uh, so I I needed to make some money down in L.A. I was totally unknown down there. And uh, so Peter taught me how to use an airbrush. And in the process of doing that, I was helping him cut friskets um, for all his illustrations. And, um, and then I, I'd been doing some Robin Trower album covers in England. And there were two more that came up whilst I was working with Peter. And... So I used an airbrush for the first time for Robin Trower's Long Misty Days album, and then again for In City Dreams. Um, and in the course of doing that, I met one of Peter's best friends, uh, Ed Scarisbrick, another English illustrator, very, very good airbrush illustrator. And um, Ed was shared a studio uh, with a guy named Charlie White. And Charlie White was good friends and had gone to college with Jim Dow, who built the Enterprise. And Jim called Charlie up and said, listen, do you know anybody, you know, who's pretty fair with an airbrush, um, you know, who could come and paint this thing for me? And um, Charlie turned around to Ed and he said, Ed, don't you know a guy who's looking for work, you know, who can wield an airbrush? And Ed said, yeah. And so Ed called me up and he said, Paul, it's Ed. How would you like to paint the Starship Enterprise? I, I can imagine that would have been a thrill. How do you answer a question like that? Well, it's there's only one answer. <laughs> as you're as you're picking up your chin off the floor and you're going, um, okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just it came out of the blue, uh, right. and in in my you know, Richard, in my life, and I'm sure in yours, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this. Um, obviously, it's what you know up to a point, but really. It's who you know is what determines your life path and, and things that happen through friends and contacts. That's sure. how it works. And, it, and then if you take advantage of the openings when they come, and sometimes an opening will come and you can't even recognize it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, 
when you you've got the gig to do to paint the enterprise you go in there you have a look and this is all covered in paul's book by the way for those of you that uh, have not read paul's book creating the enterprise i recommend that you go to paul's website get a copy you can either download it for pdf or paul will send you a pdf copy or you can get uh, the paperback version which uh, is very nicely bound and uh very well done. It also gives you a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look with some interviews that Paul did with some of the members of the crew that put together the Enterprise and how they all got involved with the project as well. But what I wanted to ask you real quickly was, when you're painting the Enterprise, how did you come up with the concept to put all of these nice iridescent paints on it instead of just, you know, outlining little panels like most other people would have done. And I understand you weren't the first artist to start the Azteking on this. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's correct. And in fact, um, uh, Richard Taylor, who designed the Enterprise, uh, working with Jim Dow, who built it, um, Richard came up with a concept of the Aztec pattern which I only just found out when I interviewed him just a few months ago in Los Angeles because there was a girl there named Susanna Swansea who was uh, just over from, the, from Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic now. And uh, it was her task to paint the Enterprise, but her airbrush skills just weren't up, up for it, really. She just didn't have the skill set to do it. And uh, so then she said, Jim, I, you know, this is beyond me. I, and so then that's when, you know, I got involved. So that was kind of already established. And then uh, Jim had uh, painted a, I can't remember, but I think a 1935 Ford uh, in iridescent paints and really liked it. And so he suggested using the iridescent paints. And uh, so I went to a big automotive uh, supply place in LA and at that time you could only get four colors and they were in little tiny four ounce pots of uh, and I got blue gold red and green and that's all you could get and they're basically transparent um, whatever color you spray them over they so if you spray it over a dark color like black then you get black pearl and on white you get well, you get mother of pearl, basically. Sure. And, that, and, and w when the ship was finished and all lit, it it looked like an opal. I mean, it took everyone's breath away. Because when I was working on it, you know, we had uh, uh, neon lights and we didn't have impressive, uh, dramatic lighting on the model. You know, we had working sure. lights on it. And uh, w when the model was finished, the, the lighting guys closed the set for three days and they... Got all, and nobody was allowed on the set, not even Doug, the director, um, until they got it all done. And then we had an unveiling, and, and we walked into this dark studio. Completely, we had to hold hands. And then they hit the switch, and I'm, everybody just gasped. I mean, it was so stunning. And I, it blew me away. I, and I thought, Jesus, did I do that? Uh, it was pretty nuts. That's amazing. I mean, your work took you from from uh, just a concept to it was eight, six or eight months that you worked on this project, was it not? Yeah, it was six. It, it was six months, and then just right at the end, uh, somebody was showing their girlfriend late at night when nobody was there. Uh, you know, and I think I know who it was, um, and. There was a whole uh, lighting console with an umbilical that went into the uh, guts of uh, into the fuselage to light the whole ship from the inside, and they blew a fuse or they did. Well, they blew the circuits in the dish, sure. and so the whole top of the dish had to be taken off and all those lights uh, redone, and then put back, and then that had to be finished off, and then I had to repaint all, all those areas. So that took another two months. Now, you did a lot of this with what people may not understand is a product called Frisket, which is a masking material that you have to cut out by hand. You lay down, and you, you do your spray, and it gives a nice, crisp, clean look when you spray it. Now, when you're spraying through this Frisket, or Frisket, pardon me, um, did, you weren't going very heavy. You were just doing a quick little spritz, were you not? 
very anything you do with an airbrush you do it very gently very lightly pass after pass after pass you build up right because because you're working with transparent colors because you're putting them on so lightly even if it's an opaque paint even if it's an acrylic paint it'll still be transparent you're building it up and so you can always add but you can't take away so in airbrushing is a very disciplined uh form of adding color to something you have to have a lot of patience and anybody who's out there who's watching this who might be contemplating um painting building and painting a model um you like uh, you, you know you just have to take it easy and do it very slowly what you may not know about paul olson is that he has been around for a long time he's done a lot of album covers he did the iconic light your fire poster which was done back in the 60s and remained a staple and one of the most popular selling posters uh, in history today. And I think you can still get reprints of it. I'm not sure, but uh, it is one of the most iconic posters today. If you have a chance and uh, you can find it in a, in a store somewhere that sells vintage posters, by all means, go get this poster. And you never know. You might see Paul at an upcoming convention somewhere. He's, uh, he's now got the convention bug from what I understand. And Paul's back with us. Here we are. All right, Paul. Uh, now this is uh, this is a frisket. This is five thousandths acetate. Okay. Uh, and uh, what this is my signature for my big my large paintings. Now I'm trying to see. Yeah. Can you see? That? We can. Um, I've cut that out, and then what I do when I sign a painting is I spray over that. So that's my. It's a stencil, is what right. it is. Um, and then you can also make stencils uh, the, on, on a ship like the Enterprise. You've got compound curves, so you you've got the, like the fuselage is curving along its length, right. and so its girth as well. And two dimensional things don't like compound curves; they'll bend one way, but they won't bend two ways. Um, and in, in some tight areas, and I would imagine with a, a, a model that's just that much smaller than the one I worked on, um, probably magic tape or there's, uh, I'm sure there's some kind of material you can get with a, with a very low tack on the back that you can cut uh, shapes out. Right. There is a frisket material out there like that, that goes by the name of frisket, and it does have a self-adhesive on the back. Well, no, I yeah, but the the stuff that I used um, right. it was pretty had quite a high tack to it. Oh, and, um, so you, you'd want a real low tack because obviously you're going to be frisketing over bits that you painted, and the last thing you want to do is is pull up that paint. Yeah, exactly, because then you're then you're in real trouble. Now, you were telling me off camera before we started the interview that there's not a section of that ship that does not have pearl iridescent paints on it there's not a section that was white okay pure so white that, okay yeah. so uh like ron grass did the engineering section um and you'll meet ron if you uh get the book and then see the videos um and he's a superb artist and the engineering section is that kind of bluey green uh bit where the uh pylons come into the fuselage sure yeah and and he he airbrushed that and he cut the friskets for that bit, um, and and that obviously that part of the ship was also white, but that little bit is his. But then every other bit that was white that wasn't already covered in a in a different color plastic um, has pearl pearl paint on it. Every bit. Oh wow, that's amazing, and and to take six months to do that is just even more amazing. <laughs> really? I mean that that the dish took a long time because yeah. you've got you've got descending radii that, because the panels are etched into the dish. Right. So you've got these these I think it's uh, nine I think it's nine circles going inwards, and so a, a, a different frisket set had to be cut for each one of those circles because the diameter was different. Right. I couldn't, you know, a, a, a panel on the outside, I couldn't use that frisket for even the next one down. So that, and cutting friskets, when, when you're doing airbrushing, 
uh, like an illustration, um, generally you spend more time drawing out the, you know, what you're going to do, but then also um, cutting Friscus. And the actual spraying is, it, it takes the least amount of time than all the preparation to do it. Yeah, it's usually the prep that takes you the, the longest amount of time. It's the same thing with the scale model that uh, our viewers are doing a lot of, and that's what our show is really all about is yeah. they need to take the time and they you know they have to lay down their their primers properly and let them dry and cure and and some people do get into a rush and when that kind of thing happens and I'm sure you've probably done this where you've been under a time crunch from time to time yeah. how devastating can that be for an artist when you're doing something as beautiful as the enterprise and you get in a rush and then you make that mistake and you go ah what do I do now well, you, and you can't. I mean, any model maker out there, I, I, you know, if you're going to go to the expense um, and carve out the time to construct one of these beautiful models and then to paint it, uh, you you just, I mean, you owe it to yourself right? Uh, to get all that preparation right and, and get your primer on there and get it sanded till it's absolutely perfect before you even start putting paint on because any imperfections are going to stay there and you're and and they're going to be magnified by the pearlescent paint that you put on regardless so you, of the scale of the model yeah exactly yeah. exactly so um and and at, you know at the end of it take your time and it, you know you may think well I, I you know I want to get this done by christmas or something or you have a a, a due date don't think in those terms. Just take your time. It's 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 like uh, it's the same if you're restoring an old car. Gotcha. The only you know you see beautiful examples where people have restored a classic car. Well, guess what they've done? I mean, they they've taken a piece of junk and uh, maybe and they've spent the time to bring every last bit of it inside and out, absolutely up to scratch. And I think you talk to most people who get involved in projects like that and you know they'll tell you that if i knew it was going to take as much time as it took i may not have even gotten involved but you you really need to do it and the end result will fill your heart with pride and joy because if you if you do it properly you'll have a knockout of a model excellent excellent now one of the things i wanted to ask you was you recently attended your your first convention as a guest and how was that experience for you in having, you know, fans come up and say, you're the guy who painted the Enterprise? What was that like for you? Well, Richard, I mean, uh, well, that's I wrote the book as a result of that. Right. I was so blown away. Um, it was a two and a half day uh, thing in London. And I live about 30 miles outside of London in this huge, enormous convention hall that I don't know how many conventions they could have on at the same time. Uh, the Star Trek one probably took up one seventh or one eighth of the space, and there were thirty thousand people there. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it was it, it was nuts, and uh, there were people from all over the world. I met um, I met well, I would speak to uh, about eight hundred people at a time, and uh, because that's the area that I had, and I gave five talks. Right. So. You know, that's quite a lot of uh, people. And uh, and people were hanging around on the outside and then would come up and have pictures taken and autographs. And I brought my meteorite um, that I bought whilst I was painting the Enterprise. And I brought that with me. And it was the only thing at the whole convention from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and the real loved, thing from outer space. The real thing from outer space. And uh, every, everyone loved that. And I let them handle it. And, uh, you know, most people have never held anything from outer space in their life. Right. And and this baby is heavy. It's eight pounds. And it's uh, and people love that. And it was it was a real pleasure to be able to say, look, just hold it. And that's you know, that's older than the earth. Not by much, but and it came from out there between Mars and Jupiter.
So now you're you're in front of all of these people. You're talking about your experiences running or, or painting the Enterprise, and and your experience yeah. working with all these fantastic model builders and crew people. And I looked at the pictures on your website, and you're stuffed into this little tiny cargo box that and painting this giant model. There doesn't even look like there's enough room to breathe in there sometimes. And you're you're in there just airbrushing like crazy. What was that like for you? Hot well, and steamy, I'll bet. <laughs> well, no, no, actually, because the building was air conditioned. Okay. So that was good. And and what the box was was a spray booth. So at one end, there were these, uh, the whole end of, of one end were a series of fans. Right. And at the other end were a series of filters and exhaust fans that then exhausted up through the roof. So I had a gentle airflow going all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, that's another thing. You know, you're going to be working with lacquers, and you have to make sure that you've got a mild airflow and that you're wearing a respirator and that you don't breathe the fumes because they're highly dangerous. But, um, you know, when Jim, when I showed him my portfolio and he said, well, I think you'll do, he said, come with me. And we walked down the hallway and he opened the door into the spray booth and there she was. Well, I mean, it was breathtaking. I can only imagine what that was like. I've never, was, I've never seen the model close up. I've only ever seen pictures of it. I saw the Christie's auction pictures, and it has, it's actually gone through an evolution since you did your original work on that that ship. And now I understand that once you did all the paint, there was a problem lighting the ship properly so that they could get the mats uh, for the overlays. Yeah. Um, Doug, uh, using it, the, the, the normal technique is using blue screen or green screen. Right. Um, so you have a blue, it's like your weatherman. Sure. Your weather woman does that all the time. But if you use a blue screen, you can't wear any blue. Because any blue you wear it is disappears. A, it dis, yeah, it's, it shows the background through. Um, and the ship looked like an opal. So it had every color every value under in the rainbow and so you, we couldn't use blue or green screen because so many bits of the ship would drop out sure and so doug used an uh, a technique called white screen where he had a huge white screen behind the model and would light the screen but not the model so the model was in silhouette against the screen to do your black pass yeah, and then so he would and he would uh, do he would bypack uh, in in camera negative uh, uh, orthographic film and orthographic film basically goes either black or clear. Mm-hmm. There's no way. Uh, and so he would have a, a negative uh, roll of orthographic graphic film bypack two two uh, layers of film together with a positive orthographic film. So that when they shot the model, they got a, and developed the film, they got a frame of, a black frame with a window of the model and a clear frame with a silhouette of the model so that they could drop in a background and then they could isolate that background and drop in the ship, the the beauty pass of the ship later on done in color film and they could combine all that in an optical um, Mac camera. Right. And um, uh, so then they could drop the beauty pass into the little window. Very cool. Now, the the ship, as I was saying earlier, went through some evolutions after the motion picture. They sprayed it down a little bit to dull out some of the, the pearlescence. And that's the way it sort of continued until it was finally sold at the Christie's auction. And if you've seen the pictures of the Christie auction, you know there's a little bit of beat up. Uh, areas in the in the warp the cells and, and in the in the engine areas and that kind of stuff. If you were asked to come back and restore that model, would that be something that would uh, would be right up your alley? Uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's a question, Richard. Um, I we I thought. I thought, I mean, the model's really beat up. It's a real shame. Right. Um, but uh, uh, do you know who bought it, by the way? Did I ben don't. Stur- 
I do not. I did watch the Christie's auction um, video, which is about two and a half hours long, uh, where they go and they, they, uh, the Okudas kind of get everything ready for it going off to Christie's. And, of course, the Enterprise, as they labeled it A, it was no longer just the refit that you worked on. They added the A to the, the end of the number. Uh, but that was the one that sold at the Christie's auction, which my understanding is that is the original model. Oh, no, it is. It is. But, it, 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 you know, because ILM, because uh, they use blue screen, um, you know, they had to kill all the all the beautiful paint on it, mm-hmm. which is a real <laughs> shame. Um, but, it, you know, it wasn't handled very well, I, I, certainly from the last movie. And I saw a, a quick little bit of, of two guys wheeling that beautiful model um, on a little dolly. And one guy's grabbing each of the engine nacelles with his bare fingers, you know, and wheeling it in. And I just, uh, it made me sick just seeing that. But um, uh, if Paul Allen, I, you know, I thought Paul Allen bought it. Mm. Now, Paul Allen, as we know, has very deep pockets. And, uh, Whoever, but whoever has it, I'd consider it. Put okay. it that way. But, but again, it's it'd be a major project, right. and it would it wouldn't be cheap. I mean, you know, we're we're probably getting on for six figures, I would think. Well, I think the person who bought it paid almost that for it. I know well, it went for a lot of money. Two hundred forty thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot that's of money. Right. But I have a feeling, uh, you know, it, the, because the 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 whole surface would have to be stripped, right? And uh, uh, and y- you know, prepare it all again. Uh, so, uh, you know, it 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 would be a very very expensive project. But I'll tell you what, I think two hundred forty thousand dollars was a bargain. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Now, David said, I, I you know, it's. I mean, that model is only going to increase in value. And if it was done properly, especially if we got the, like, Mark's, well, Mark Stetson couldn't do it because he's he's just too busy and making too much money. (laughs) But um, Jim could put me in touch with some good model makers. He, you know, because he's still working. And so he, you know, got his fingers on that. Um, And getting the model prepared... um, Whatever it costs, if it costs one hundred, one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars, it'd be money well spent. Sure, I I don't doubt that in the least. I mean, if if I could afford to have an eight foot model in my studio, I would. If I had the room, I would. But unfortunately, I don't. So I have to I have to go with a much smaller three foot model, and uh, it'll look good when I'm done. I hope. I now you uh you allude in your book and for those people that have not read paul's book creating the enterprise i can't recommend it highly enough uh because there are some great stories in there one story in particular about after the saucer was opened and some parting gifts let's say went into the saucer um what possessed you guys to put these little items in the saucer before it was closed back up? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we were having fun. And, and uh, at, at that point in time, there, you know, nobody had any idea that there was ever going to be more than one Star Trek film. Right. And in fact, you know, it was, it was only because Star Wars came out that changed everybody's mind at Paramount. Because they were planning a TV special. Um, and a whole series of models were built for TV, and then they had to trash them uh, because they decided to make a movie, and so they had to start over. Um, and our model was going to be shipped. It was all arranged and everything to the Air and Space Museum in, in Washington, D.C., and, um, you know, I'd have a piece hanging up in there, and I was really looking forward to that. And um, But, you know, if anybody had said, you know, they were going to be up to date, what, 13 more movies made. I mean, nobody would have believed you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, it, the model, you know, the Enterprise had its own box and it was all packed up and ready to be shipped off to Washington. Sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> the question w- was about the, the parting gifts that you put inside the saucer section. We won't tell people what they are because I want them to read the book. 
And it's a lot more entertaining reading how yeah. you guys went about that. But yeah. um, what was the thought process to put those things in the, those items inside the saucer? Well, because uh, that's where my train of thought was going, because this lovely model was going to be hanging in the Air and Space Museum, <laughs> and only we would know what was inside it. So it was, it was a snicker moment every time you got to see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, uh, the guys at uh, ILM, uh, and, and this, you know, when that was all put together in L.A., uh, I think they put a uh, a little miniature Coke bottle on on the on the big um, uh, battle cruiser that opens the scene. Okay. In Star Wars, I think in there somewhere, and I somewhere also is a Mickey Mouse, a little tiny Mickey Mouse. On I'd the models. heard that. I'd heard that. Um, now, you also uh, were privy to the most expensive arboretum built for the starship enterprise and that's the little <laughs> garden area we won't tell people any more about that either but when you heard that story did your eyes kind of go what well i just i just <laughs> laughed uh, i mean back you know when back in the late 70s and the 80s uh in la um uh how can i put this uh social norms were uh, a lot different than right. they are now. Sure. Uh, if you went over to someone's house, um, you were not just offered a drink. And um, uh, and Ron, who did the garden, right. so that you look through the windows and there's an arboretum or garden in there, um, worked on that garden very meticulously because he was he's 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 a complete artist he's not only great at airbrushing and painting but model making as well and so it came to him to make the garden and uh he uh he made a very interesting garden <laughs> i should say so <laughs> now in the new kit that polar lights put out the three the one three fifty scale they actually have an arboretum in there yeah. Unlike the 22 inch that came out back in the 70s uh, from AMT, so I'm just wondering now how many modelers that are going to read your book are are maybe going to add that extra little touch. <laughs> well, it's uh, <laughs> they'd be they'd be highly disciplined if they did. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, uh, but um, uh, yeah, you just or, don't yeah. want to see the model after they get desperate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have a little compartment, you know, where you can spring up in the lock. <laughs> At the bottom, like a, a torpedo bay or something. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So now you've moved on from the Enterprise. You continue to this day to still do artwork, of course. You're doing your own artwork. Are you still working on album covers? Uh, no, I haven't done any album covers for a long time. Uh, there's just no money in it anymore, right. you know, CDs. I mean, there's just, you know, and, and, you know, with computers and everything, any, any, anybody can create something halfway decent. And, you, you know, you're not going to get a great piece of art on a four and a half by four and a half inch square. Sure. Now, so, uh, let me ask you about that, the transition from traditional art and you and i are both traditional artists i think in, in uh, many respects we both still go back to that pencil and paper and and inks and and that kind of stuff with the advent yeah. now of digital um rendering and and that kind of stuff how has that changed art for yourself do you do much of that or you still do a lot of the traditional work no i mean if, if somebody needs something done uh, but I haven't I haven't done a lot. Uh, you know, one of my Robin Trower covers was the well, the last two I did for him um, were both digital. But I mean, the last one I did was nine years ago. Right. Um, and, you know, I've done bits and pieces uh, for uh, my golf club and we do ads. And so I take photographs and I'll do a bit of digital enhancing. And but I'm doing a lot of photography and uh and writing and uh and working on large airbrush paintings but um uh but mainly at, at the moment i've been concentrating on the writing right and you this is not your only book you've done actually a couple of other books as well 
one for men and one for women. Tell us a little bit about those books before we move on. Yeah, I, I wrote this um, this book, the, the book, book of, of love, love. For, for women, and the book of lust for men. And so the man's book and the woman's book read upside down and backwards to each other, meeting in the middle. The metaphor being, as men and women are just you know, um, and the book is filled with the wit and wisdom of the fabulous Mae West, who I luckily met the year before she died. Fabulous. And I was blown away when I met her. I met her in her trailer. She was working on a film with uh, Timothy Dalton called Sextet in, uh, at MacArthur Park in L.A. And she was in her trailer. And a girl I was seeing at the time um, was an extra and, and, and was good friends with May and uh, it blew me away when she said she was talking about May and I said, May, May, who? And she said, May West. I went, oh. I, was, I loved May West since I was about eight years old. Right. And uh, so Liberty uh, arranged with May for me to meet her in between takes. And uh, so I walked up to the trailer and May has sat at her, her Hollywood uh, makeup mirror you know with all the light bulbs around and everything yeah. and every, everything in the room was pink and um and may was sitting down and she must have been in her 80s i think and liberty said uh may this is paul paul this is may and may looked up and held her hand up to be kissed and she said well hello <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather <laughs> but um i've always been impressed with her um because you know she i mean she was a playwright mm -hmm. and and lured out to hollywood uh against her wishes really but i mean the money was too too good to pass up and um but she hated the, they had a thing called the Hayes office and, you know, America was, well, still is, but really was very prudish back in the thirties. And you couldn't have anything to do with sex right. on the screen. Uh, you couldn't even have a man and a woman in, in the same bed together. The, the man would have to have one leg on the floor, one leg out of the bed on sure. the floor. And um, so she cleverly found her way around uh, using double entendre or double entendre or however it's pronounced. <laughs> um, and everyone loved her for it because she got away with, you know, she said, like, I've been in more laps than a napkin. <laughs> what a great line. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and uh, she, she said, um, uh, the curve is more powerful than the sword. And then, of course, is that a pistol in your pocket or are you just glad to see me? You know. Right. But anyway, the book is filled with a lot of that. And um, look what I got. While you, I got <laughs> you have the book that uh, details your experience in getting to the Enterprise and past that. Yeah. It is and a wonderful book. For, for I, anybody that, that has not read that book, I... I can't recommend it enough. Get out to Paul's website, which is where, Paul? At um, www. Well, it's, it's HTTP now, it's, isn't it? But anyway, it's Star Trek, Star Trek one word, hyphen enterprise dot US. And the book is available both in a soft cover and digital format, correct? Yeah, that's right. Now, there's a bonus when you get the digital format. And tell people what that is. A bonus? Isn't there a little bonus that when you when you click in the digital format, it'll take you into an unlocked area of your website? Oh yeah, but that, that you get that with the with the uh, printed book as oh, well. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, you do. Um, but obviously, you can't click. <laughs> yeah, right. But you're you're given the the URL. But uh, yeah, I mean the if if you buy the the book, you get the PDF version, which is a nice, simple, easy way to do it. Um, you, it's exactly the same as the book without having the physical book, and you can, uh, you, you know, read it on a tablet or your computer. But um, you also get access to the expanded website, and you get, a, you know, you get access to these to the video interviews that I did with uh, Ron and Mark, 
who worked ahead of me, and with Richard and Jim, who designed and built the enterprise. And, and those interviews are priceless. I mean, they're just the stuff I didn't know <laughs> when I was interviewing them. Right. And, uh, well, you, you, I mean, you've seen them. I've seen them. They are wonderful interviews. And for anybody that's a Star Trek fan or a Star Trek model maker, um, I can't recommend those enough. Uh, so go and check them out. Once you've got the book, click on it or type in the URL if you've got the, the paperback version and go and watch these videos because they are full of information you would have never, ever thought that you would ever hear about the Starship Enterprise and their experiences getting to use and work on the Enterprise. Now, you have, uh, just before we wrap things up, you have contributed to a new I, painting I, I, guide. I, What's that? I could talk all day. Oh, we, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk all day, but the interview is only going to last so long. I like uh, it. But you have um, one of the only remaining... Uh, sheets of decals that went on to the enterprise is that correct okay now this isn't one of the, the only, only surviving this is the sheet. Only. look how yeah. big that thing is it's um yeah it's uh, there's my hand for scale wow but that was um yeah you you can see pretty much all of it there um Paramount, the, the silk screen department, the sign making department right. um, at Paramount, uh, printed up about 50 of these decal sheets. And, and uh, they're, they're the ones you wet and slide off, you know, that you put on models and mm -hmm. things. And because silk screen is not a very accurate uh, process, Getting the registration of the different colors, you're lucky if you hit it, if, if you get two or three colors all registered together at once because right. it's a separate pass each time. And it's all done by hand. Everything is done by hand. The sheets are placed by hand, and you know, and then the squeegee is passed by hand. So they thought if they printed up about 50, they might get four or five that were really good, which is about what they got. Mm -hmm. And, of course, putting them on the model, you know, the... You don't get it right, and they wrinkle up, and so you have to toss that one in. So after the model had all its decals on and everything was hunky-dory, then the rest of the sheets I found in a, in a trash can all rolled up. And I thought, hello? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to, you know. And so I went through them, and uh, some of them had been wrinkled and everything, and um, I, I took out three of the best ones and then they went and i auctioned one off at uh, at a eric clapton um uh, uh charity back in oh i think it was in about 2002 or something like that i was living in la but i came over here to england and um uh and was at one of hit one of eric's uh, charities and so it was a charity that i liked and so i gave that to the charity and that went for i think it went for about seventeen hundred dollars and um and then i sold the other one as soon as i moved over here in 2005 and a guy in scotland bought that and he paid um he paid a thousand pounds so about sixteen hundred dollars for it but i was told when i was at the um at the destination uh, star trek london show uh, a lot of people came up to me and said you know that's that's got to be worth fifteen thousand dollars oh easily easily and you have one of the few remaining gold jackets uh that were given out to crew from the <laughs> from the uh, from the original uh movie and you're getting that all signed and there's pictures of that on your website and exactly. uh it's uh you've got uh, quite the collection of signatures on there now and you're planning on taking this along with the decal sheet and you're going to auction them off at Christie's at some point are you not well yeah i have to uh, what i want to do um is you know get the book out there more um i've uh i'm dealing with an agent in new york now waiting to see if they want to handle it and if they uh can uh, convince Simon and Schuster, who put out most of the Star Trek books anyway. Right. They have a department just devoted to Star Trek. Um, so to see if I can 
you know, build up some interest and, and some visibility maybe over the next year or two. And then, um, uh, you know, and then see if Christie's or Sotheby's uh, might want to do something. Having only two bits, it might be difficult. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, amazing that you're getting that out there. And those two bits, I mean, they're going to do more Star Trek auctions in the future. And I know there's a museum here in Alberta that is totally dedicated to Star Trek and Star Trek memorabilia. It's called the Trek Cetra Museum. And uh, they've got a lot of props from the television series. I'm not sure that they have any from the movies, but I do know that they have a lot of props from the television series and costumes and that sort of thing. So maybe it might end up there. Who knows? Yeah, I, 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 and really, um, you know, I've I've had I've had this stuff for a long, well, 34 years now. Wow. Um, so you know, it, it's it's time for someone who would really love to have my crew jacket signed by everyone i haven't got nimoy's signature on it but i'm working on that um and uh but it's got everyone else and um uh to have my crew jacket and also you know this decal sheet somebody who will love it to bits and love owning it well i'm sure there's a buyer out there for it somewhere now, uh, just before we uh, we conclude our interview, I do want to ask you about the new painting guide that came out recently from Trek Modeler. How much influence or input did you have in that guide? Um, I don't. I don't know what. Um, uh, I think John, uh, who's the, who's Mister Trek Modeler, um, he, he you know he mentions the book. Uh, when did the guide come I out? I think the guide came out the early part of 2013. Right. So he probably picked up, uh, because in, in my book, there's a whole air, uh, section on you right. know how to paint the model and everything. But uh, also on my website, on my Olsen Art website, um, there's a whole section for modelers. Well, there was a whole section for modelers. I took it off, and it's in the book now. But uh, So he could have gotten gotten it one way or the other from gotcha. that um but y you know not to take anything away from john i'm sure he's a you know i've seen his website and he does beautiful work so you know he's obviously a talented guy on his own well i i gotta admit i went and i bought a copy of his book as well as buying a copy of your book both on the same day and now that i've got both of them they're a great resource one to the other and i gotta tell you paul thank you very much for uh, putting out the book that you did, giving us a glimpse into your life, giving us a glimpse into your experiences while working on the Enterprise, and just being a hell of a guy, man. Uh, well, Richard, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. And um, I hope everyone out there, um, you know, does a real good job on their model. <laughs>